great no, it's in progress. <laughs> now, evening, everybody. Very nice to see you. Um, I'd hoped to do a bit of socialising this evening after all this time, but I've got some disgusting yogi, so I've been keeping my distance. I apologise for that. Anyway, it's very nice to see the turnout here. And isn't it nice to be back with people? Yes. Anyway, thank you, people. Um, I thought a lot about what I could say about Nick, because there's so many good things. I worked with him for years, but also he was a great judge at Bristol, as we all know. And I decided in the end, apart from the sort of, um, my next guest needs no introduction, the Rot Rotary Club style, um, <laughs> the, the thing I felt was most important about this role for Nick is how great we all used to feel when Nick was doing a case in Bristol. Didn't matter what side you were on, you just knew that your client was going to be respected and was going to be listened to and was going to be treated with dignity. Um, you often have awkward clients, well, <laughs> Perhaps you don't, but the, the lucky ones are sometimes do. And, um, you know, occasionally they're not happy with the judge or they want to blame other people. In the whole years that Nick sat at Bristol, not one client ever said to me that they thought it hadn't been fair. And I think that in Nick's new role, that's going to be a really important quality. It's going to work really well for him. Um, because the whole point about alternative dispute resolution is people have to have a level of collaboration if possible and feel heard and feel respected. Um, and that's one thing that Nick always achieved. And I just knew when I went into court, I just thought, great, however bad or great my case is, um, mm -hmm. the client is going to know they were heard and respected afterwards. And I'm sure you all shared that experience. I've never heard a bad word about anybody ever saying that anything that Nick did in court didn't feel fair to the clients. Um, so that's all I'm going to say about it, because I think he's going to be really good at this role. Um, and I think the world is changing for all of us, and it's a direction in which we will find ourselves moving, I think, like it or not. There are huge backlogs, getting into court is hard, um, and the idea of something a bit more collaborative is, most of us anyway, have been embracing over the last few years with great success, actually. So, welcome Nick. Thank you, everybody. I saw this was called the Nick Master Launch. <laughs> so I assume at the end of this, Sue will come and break a bottle of champagne over my head. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> uh, well, it's a great pleasure uh, for me to be here speaking to you uh, at the launch of the St John's Chambers Arbitration Service. I nearly said St John's Ambulance. <laughs> but of course, it's very similar. Um, I feel I owe you all an apology, first of all. For those of you who thought you'd seen the last of me in December, I'm very sorry. <laughs> but it was either this or golf. And quite frankly, I hate golf. <clears throat> you have no idea how weird it is being back in St John's Chambers. It's a bit like I've taken an interstellar voyage, travelling at the speed of light. Uh, you know, it seems to me as, only, as though only a few months have passed. Everybody else is aged 16 years. <laughs> the pupils are now silks. And uh, the seniors have, with one shining exception, retired. As for the staff, uh, well, there's been a, nearly a 100% turnaround. Although I can't help noticing that there's one guy in the class who looks strangely familiar. <laughs> now, arbitration in family work is a hot topic at the moment. Uh, the DFJ of Bristol, always good for a quote, is one of its strongest supporters. I said in a recent talk to Bristol Law Society that it was an idea whose time had come, and it's nice to see that the Court of Appeal agree with me. Uh, in the case of K&K, &K, 2022 EWCA CIB 468, the first time you will ever have heard me, those who have appeared in front of me, <laughs> quote a case, it, it was an idea, it, it was a uh, said by the Master of the Rolls and the President that it was clear that both prior to the issue of court proceedings and up to the, the, the FHDRA, the parties, the lawyers, and after issuing the judge, should consider if non-court dispute resolution is appropriate. And that wasn't just mediation, they said, but any other ways of resolving the dispute which the present to which the present application related. Now, unless they were talking about trial by ordeal uh, or battle, uh, I think that they were referring to arbitration there. What is it? 
Uh, well, the simple definition uh, is uh, one that I, which is quite robust as well, from the American Dictionary. The formal process of having an outside person chosen by both parties to a disagreement, bringing that disagreement to an end. Arbitration has a long history in commercial insurance and trade disputes, amongst other things, but it's only in the last 10 years that it's been imported into family dispute. It's very important to understand that arbitration is a completely different process to mediation. Mediation is where the parties are assisted to reach an agreement, that assistance being supplied by a skilled and experienced mediator. I'm sure that many of you have been involved in cases which have gone to mediation and which seemed to be an intractable dispute, dispute, but are negotiated to a compromise with the assistance of that mediator, which would have seemed impossible at the start of the process. There are, however, some cases where mediation is not possible. Sometimes this is apparent before the mediation process starts, and sometimes it becomes apparent during the process itself. Not all of these disputes are capable of being arbitrated, but many are. Until the 22nd of February 2012, the only way in any family dispute to go when mediation didn't work or proved impossible was to court. It, it was recognised then, and it is even more recognised now, that going to court in private law, children and financial proceedings has become more and more difficult. The problem arises out of the sheer volume of work going through the family court and the lack of court resources to deal with it. Let me make it absolutely clear that by these comments, I mean no respect to my former judicial, no, no disrespect to my former judicial <laughs> colleagues, uh, no, no disrespect to my former judicial colleagues, who are literally run off their feet with the avalanche of work. Just look at the lists for the CJs in Bristol, uh, and even more so the district judges and magistrates court, who are now taking the bulk of uh, children private law. The resources are not available in terms of court time and judge power to be able to match the appropriate judge to the particular case, keep judicial continuity and try to conclude any case in an appropriate time scale and without ballooning costs. Delay, multiple adjournments, changes of judges, cases running over into several hearing days because your case has had to take its place behind any number of other urgent matters, care directions, injunctions and so on. The last 12 months have seen this position, in my view, get much worse, simply again because of the backlog of cases, and care cases in particular, due to the pandemic. There is now virtually no space in circuit judges' lists for private children work, and very little space in district judges' lists. Inevitably, this means waiting a long time to be heard, lengthy adjournment dates, and a great deal of cost for the parties, and a great deal of pain and unhappiness for them and their families whilst what was at one point a solvable dispute becomes a poisonous, festering one, as the frustration and the anger multiply. Read the case of K that I referred to earlier. That was a dispute which started off about the terms of children's visiting and ended up in a lengthy fact-finding case, years later, massively expensive litigation. If you operate early, chances are that the patient won't lose an arm, or in many cases, an arm and a leg. Um, my suggestion of an appropriate way forward in many cases would be arbitration. This is, some people say, going to create a two-tier justice system. I don't like the two-tier health system and two-tier education system. But as a judge, I passionately believed in the phrase justice for all, and in my judicial oath. And I am conscious of this criticism. But the counter argument is that use of arbitration will actually help the system by taking certain cases out of it. After all, in the master of the roles, the president of the family division and the de designated family judge from Bristol all support something in principle. I've got to find that reassuring. The reality is that pre pandemic it was taking 28 weeks to deal with cases in private law court application. The last figure I made was 42 weeks now of counting. What are the options and how does it work? Well, the Family Law Arbitration Scheme was launched by the Institute of Family Law Arbitrators, which is a non-profit organisation created by the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators, together with Resolutions, the Family Bar Association, and the Centre for Child and Family Reform. 
There are two arbitration schemes running, the financial and property one, which also takes in uh, matrimonial finance, but also cohabitation disputes to larger proceedings and so on. And that commenced in 2012. Then one for children in private law proceedings commenced in 2016. They're both governed by the Arbitration Act of 1996. Anybody wishing to find out more about arbitration in general should go to Professor Robert Merkin QC's definitive book on the subject. Uh, yes, I am on the percentage. He and I were flatmates at college. Uh, he kindly autographed uh, his book on arbitration for me. Uh, it's that big. Uh, I have read the first three or four pages. Uh, uh, and uh, it's currently hold, uh, holding up my white back. Uh, but it is very interesting. And uh, if you buy it, please mention my name. The law applied in family arbitration is the law of England and, and, and Wales, and the parties can't contract out of that, although they can agree the terms and scope of the arbitration and its procedure. I should point out that not all family disputes are suitable for arbitration. Arbitrators are not allowed to deal with child protection issues. So, for instance, where allegations of physical or sexual abuse are contained in the case, it's not capable of being arbitrated. These are cases of domestic abuse allegations, and arbitrators can't make findings of fact about these sorts of issues. They're totally inappropriate. Indeed, if child protection issues are raised during the course of the arbitration, for example, if somebody starts at some point in the hearing to make allegations about child safety or physical abuse, the arbitrator has to stop the case and refer the issue to the local social services department. That shouldn't take any of you by surprise, because of course, in an arbitration case, the first thing the parties have to do is to agree to arbitrate. And these sorts of child protection issues, in my view, preclude that in any event. I should also point out that vulnerable parties, that is a person with capacity issues, will find arbitration is not appropriate for them, in particular because their ability to give informed agreement to arbitrators lack. However, there are many cases where arbitration is appropriate. Most cases of the parties in being in dispute about child children's arrangements don't have safeguarding issues and are appropriate to be arbitrated. These are the sort of cases we're all familiar with, where both parties have perfectly respectable positions and just need somebody to decide who's right. For example, the case of in the UK, as I've already said, cases of reallocation to another part of the country, both in principle and also uh, involving reframing the amount of time that each of the parties spend with the children, uh, which for many reasons, uh, some of the most emotional parties might be intractable, are in my view resolvable by arbitration, as are disputes about removal from a jurisdiction, either for a holiday or permanently. In fact, in those cases where time is in an essence, arbitration is particularly useful in my view. For instance, educational issues, uh, some minor health issues, and issues of principle like that well capable of being arbitrated and arbitrated quickly. I'm not a financial arbitrator, but Zoe Saunders is, and she indicates to me that all forms of financial dispute, both arising from marriage and cohabitation, are suitable for arbitration, perhaps even more suitable in children's cases. I'm going to take you through the stages of arbitration. In most cases, litigants, in, in some cases, litigants in person may want to arbitrate, but I'm going to deal with what I'm going to say today on the basis that it's a case where solicitors involved on both sides. And in fact, when you qualify, you are told to be very careful about taking political in person cases as an arbitrator. Well, there are all sorts of issues about inequality of arms, inequality of bargaining power, etc. etc. So I'm looking at dealing with cases where solicitors on both sides. So let's say our example, we've got two parents who separated, say seven years ago, with two children. A boy and a girl were three and five, respectively. They managed to agree that the children would live the majority of their time with mum and spend a lot of time with dad. But now time's moved on, the children are 10 and 12. They're friends, commitments, out of school activities. Mum and dad also have relationships and demanding jobs. One wants to change things around to reflect the realities of the children's lives. Father wants things to stay the same. Sound familiar? The two solicitors send the parties to mediation, but it just doesn't work. Not because anybody's being particularly unreasonable, bad feels threatened, 
in his status. Mum feels that dad's not being very helpful and won't recognise that uh, his daughter, for instance, wants to play in the netball team uh, and that knocks out an evening of his, of his time with her. The two solicitors uh, <clears throat> and, the media, and the mediator talk. And the mediator says, you know, what's really needed here is just for somebody to cut through the knot and make the decision. Well, the two sisters know that if you're going to do it, you get a judge to do that. You're talking about another six months delayed uh, and um, both suggest arbitration. The parties who are in many ways eminently reasonable and sensible agree and sign the document to that effect. That's the agreement to arbitrate. It's a children's arbitration. So they have to provide some safeguarding information, usually just a police check on safeguarding issues, the sort of thing that you're all familiar with with job applicants and so on. The two of you, two, two uh, counsel, as uh, two solicitors, or could be counsel, of course, uh, then agree an arbitrator. The next step is a, a first meeting between the two solicitors and the arbitrators. Uh, is Luke, yes, he is here. I'm going to say something to upset him now. We might want to go out of the room. This first meeting is free. <laughs> uh, it's almost always a remote meeting, at some time convenient to all three of the, uh, of the, of the people there. The, the, the clients don't need to attend. You give the arbitrator a brief synopsis of the case and he agrees whether to take it or not. At that meeting, he says the seat of the arbitration is Bristol or Bath or wherever it happens to be. Now, this is just a magic phrase which says that the, that means that the position uh, of law, that, that the, the propositions of law that will be used in the case are the laws of England and Wales. So we're bang at home, Children Act Territory, Children Act Territory, uh, and all of the deciding cases, cost rules, et cetera, et cetera. So that's all that phrase means. The seat of the arbitration is bang. That's the country that the, the laws go, uh, govern. Um, on... Um, So you briefly discuss the format of the arbitration. Some cases can be done by written submissions. Again, you're all familiar with uh, those sorts of cases. You remember the one that Judge Wildblood had about what stop on the motorway it should be, which ended about two years later with, I think, an attempted murder. And yeah, I, I, um, the, 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 those are the sort of cases which can be dealt with by written submissions. It's all a holiday. I want to take the children skiing. Why? Because of these six reasons. I'm against it because of these six reasons short uh, uh, um, arbitration issue by the arbitrator. And I, that's the sort of thing, quite frankly, you can do in two weeks. So you discuss the format. It's not a case for written submissions. Uh, it may be a case where you want per, uh, submissions in person so that the clients can hear what you're saying. You may want to put in witness statements by the parties. You may even need expert witnesses, other witnesses, oral evidence and cross-examination, which will be tightly controlled to the issue being arbitrated. On anything but the simplest case, after the arbitrator has agreed to arbitrate, you should agree a second short hearing where you're accompanied by your clients, either in person or remotely, and that can be quickly set up. At that hearing, you look at what evidence and format the arbitration should take, what is going to be filed, when it's going to be filed, and so on. Uh, so the analogy is with a directions appointment. Uh, it's very informal again, uh, and it, there, it injects a momentum into things. And also, you're not going to be saying, well, we can't file that for eight weeks because we're waiting for such and such. Get it done. You also have to think about the voice of the child in the case. Arbitrators cannot see children. There is no provision for that, and I'm told that it is highly unlikely that there ever will be. And of course, there's no Kafkas. Anybody remember Kafkas? <laughs> they used to hang around the courts occasionally and try and help. Um, so the normal way forward is in, in a case like this one that we're dealing with, would be to agree an independent <clears throat> social worker to do a short wishes and feelings report. Uh, now, there are, plenty, there are lots of them uh, in, in, in practice. Uh, and they usually, on that very discreet issue, like going to see that ten and twelve, you know, and saying, "What, you know, what do you, how do you really want this to go?" Uh, that can be done very quickly. Um, same thing. The same thing with um, 
most cases, and obviously you adjust what's necessary depending on the ages of the children involved as well. You can imagine other cases, uh, like leave to remove from the jurisdiction, where you might need evidence about another legal system. Or in financial cases, you may need expert financial evidence. Always this will be an agreed one witness uh, and somebody that both of the solicitors trust and rely upon. Uh, again, it, the uh, profusion of experts uh, um, is totally inappropriate for an arbitration cases. The costs of this are all inevitably split equally between the parties. It is unless some very serious misconduct has gone on, very unlikely that there will be any orders for costs in a, in a, a, a family arbitration. Uh, of course, that's the case in family cases in general in this area. So you've now got your roadmap forward. Finally, you list, you list the arbitration either remotely or in person. And as I said, you list it quickly. The third stage is the arbitration itself. And I'm not going to say very much about this because this is, this is the bit that's most likely very job. You've agreed the scope and format. Now it's just the hearing of the arbitration itself. It's always a good idea to work out whatever is going to be called, by the way. Um, uh, the, uh, a look of horror on a colleague's face when he was telling a story about uh, then the, um, uh, the father turned to me and he said, well, Jim, or whatever, you know, that's going to take some getting used to. Uh, but work out um, the choreography as well. Uh, are you going to have a remote hearing? Uh, are you going to um, have some uh, live evidence and so on? If so, you can come, for instance, to St. John's and use one of our one of the rooms here. Uh, or you're going to have it all. And the more it gets like an ordinary court hearing, the more worried the arbitrator is going to be. Is this the right thing to do in the circumstances? The other thing is that um, once the um, case has been dealt with, I would always say, right, well, I'm going to give you a judgment. Uh, I'm, just, uh, oh, sorry. <laughs> I'm going to give you an arbitration on such and such a day and stick to that. And the other enormous advantage here is that the arbitrator will only have one thing to deal with. So he won't go home that night and say, I'm just going to go up to my study and do the arbitration. Oh, this is just coming for you to read for tomorrow. It's just a completely different ball game uh, to, to uh, the problems that the judge has. Uh, it's the difference between doing one thing well, I hope, and a lot of things badly. Uh, and um, so the arbitration and the award, which is what the order is called, uh, are drafted. And so what I would do, for instance, is I would go through very much like a judgment, but in, perhaps not in the, same, in, the, in the same detail, but I'd apply you know, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the welfare checklist, refer to some of the evidence, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and then um, I would make the award, which is the, which is the, um, what would then be turned by you into the order. And I don't know if you're aware of this, but what you would do would be the two of you, once you have the arbitration, uh, the arbitration to hand, would put your heads together and say, well, what's really been ordered here is uh, alternate weekends with each of the parents or permission to remove for the holiday for these, this number of weeks with these caveats, et cetera, et cetera. You draw up an order and you file that. And if the order says um, uh, this order is by agreement and after an arbitration by so-and-so, so-and-so, the court will rubber stamp it. But the court will then enforce it. Because, of course, I can't enforce anything uh, as a private person. That's one of the problems with arbitration. So you sometimes people say, OK, well, we know and uh, we we are prepared to work with this, no need to have an order. I would be a little bit worried about that. Uh, and I think that the formality of getting an order made, it, it would be very helpful. Uh, one thing now to cheer Luke up, having depressed him. Uh, when the, arbitra the arbitration is completed, that is, in old speak, the judgment is ready, uh, we notify you and you've got to pay. <laughs> we have a lien on the arbitration until the money is produced. Um, 
That was the real reason why I'm doing all of this. No, uh, no. <laughs> <coughs> uh, so uh, when you look at arbitration cases, um, the parties have got to be told you can withdraw at any point in the process. Depending on the reasons, there might be cost issues there. And I would deal, you know, if one of the parties that I, uh, I was told about a case when we were doing training where one of the parties sent a threat to the arbitrator, but unless they, they came down his way. So the arbitrator had to withdraw and made uh, a, 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 an adjudication that all of the costs would be uh, paid by that particular person because of the conduct. That order was then registered at the court and it was enforced. Uh, so, you, but that's the most you know, bizarre behaviour you can think of, because of course the parties want to be there. That's the great difference. They want to be there, and they've been part of the process. It's amazing how different it is when there are five of you in the room, rather than when there are twenty-five and there are another twenty-five waiting outside for the next case. <clears throat> I'd expect to be able to conclude children's arbitration cases in of eight weeks, say, start to finish, subject to the party's availability, workloads, and the ISW report or any other issues. Uh, and of course, when you compare that to the timeline for, for private law work in the courts, um, it's a completely different universe. A word about appeals. Um, once you've arbitrated, you can't go back to court and ask for a redetermination. Under the Arbitration Act, an award or determination can be challenged if the award is made without jurisdiction under 60, Section 67, if there's been a serious irregularity that has caused, will cause substantial injustice under Section 68, or if there is an appeal on a point of law under Section 69. Challenges under these sections can be brought 28 days after the date of the award and determination by the court. In court you will note how like these bases for challenge charges are to the sorts of reasons that you appeal. Recently, the courts have been prepared to intervene on a fairly regular basis. It's a very unusual event, but, but on a fairly regular basis in family arbitration. Uh, 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 they did at one stage have a, have a, a, a um, almost a policy of not being prepared to do so. But my view is now that given the grounds for, for, the grounds for intervention and the way that the case law is going, uh, I think that you're just as protected, as much protected, or indeed as little protected, uh, as you would be against a judicial error after court proceedings. Finally, what are the advantages? The time scale is compressed, drastically if you need it to be, <clears throat> Yours is the only matter the arbitrator has to deal with that day. You and the parties have continuity of decision making. Since you've picked the arbitrator, you have confidence in that person. The dispute, each dispute, has a bespoke feeling about it rather than one size fits all. Costs are agreed from the start, unless some eventuality either means that they can be put down or sometimes occasionally put up. Uh, let's say if a case overruns or if something settles after a, a report's been produced, I would always be willing to, to, to look at the fee situation there. So you've got speed, flexibility, control of costs, confidence in the arbitrator, and most of all, as Sue mentioned in her introduction, the parties have agreed to be part of this process from the start. And that really does, in my very limited experience, make a terrific difference. Uh, they feel a real sense of ownership of the case. Uh, and I feel that that leads to much less damage to the parties and most of all to the children can, uh, that, that are most concerned in these court, sorts of court, uh, case, case in court proceedings. The case won't drag on, there will be an end. You will not have to continue to write checks to your solicitor. This is the timeline, it works. Thank you. Um, now, 